show. I'm Phil. I'm here on the show. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hello, Phil. Hi, Sky Suction Cup Head. I, I haven't used this in a while. I thought I'd <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, great. It makes nice marks on your noggin. We can spell uh, like a message out in suction cup it's pickies. Advertising space. Have I yes. told you guys about Can Head? What? Can Head. He's a guy. And Christian Taylor. <laughs> He's a guy that has a ball head like this, and, and he, he crushes sticks, cans. No, he sticks the cans all over his head, and I kid you not, it's like a, his act, and they stay, and he walks around with all these cans. Well, and that's it. That's, that's tremendous. It. It's like a stupid <laughs> that, human. That's trick. his talent. Yeah, that stupid shows human. how far we have evolved. Hi, Phil. Hi. Hi. Um, Jason Lay pointed out last week that my Carl Sagan sounded suspiciously like my Pastor Paul. Yes. From what's in the yep, Bible, I agree. to which I say guilty as charged. I'm sorry, but then Mary Kate McLean said, "Please sing the next podcast theme song as Carl Sagan." So I'm going to attempt to Pastor Paul. sing the theme song as Carl Sagan, not Pastor Paul. Okay, which is going to be profoundly hard. He's not British, though. He's not br- billions and billions of galaxies and the universe and hey it's a podcast what do you know see no it went british now it's pastor paul you oh, always go british so though. hard it's your like default voice british. i'm anglophile yeah <laughs> Un- unwittingly anglophiliac hey it's a podcast so there's no video but there is and it's extremely extraordinary hey it's a podcast so lend an ear the phil fisher podcast starts billions and billions of years ago right about here we'll talk to sky hi carl (laughs) (laughs) and christian too hi carl and boys and girls oh you've evolved so wonderfully today we're all very proud of you thank you and maybe a guest in fact there is a guest i hope it's neil degrasse tyson my my protege here just for you it's not Neil deGrasse Tyson, but that's, don't tell Carl, he'll cry. Hey, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right amazingly, astonishingly, as we've seen it evolve out of the cosmos. It's right here. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> Remarkable. Not so sure about what? The that, impression. That... You don't even know Carl Sagan. You weren't born. I've seen you Carl Sagan. Yet. Yes, I was born. <laughs> you were two. I was older than two. <laughs> Not I, much. much. <laughs> I it was, was older than two. Ago. You were eight. You were seven. How I was certainly old enough to watch Cosmos. But not to understand it. Not back it. then. Oh, not to remember. You don't know my cognitive abilities at eight his years old. Voice. Were you already <laughs> bald from thinking so hard? I was quite the opposite mm. of bald. Like a tiny. You had a big head of hair. I had a lot no. of hair. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What happened to it? My brain got so big it just <laughs> squeezed the follicles just started and the hair fell popping, out. popping out. So last week we had the Cosmos Smackdown. Uh, Paul Vanderclay and Ryan Fox both pointed out other folks on the web discussing the exact same thing. The show's bad history. It's anachronistic camels, so to speak. Um, which kind of leads to the question: Did they really? If everyone is noticing. Why did they do that? Did they think? How much research did they really do? I'm sure they did lots of research, but at some point they just said, yeah, a lot of people said we were inaccurate 30 years ago about Galileo. Did they come out and say that? Did they admit? No, uh, uh, no, but it's kind of commonly understood now that it was fairly inaccurate. And so they went, let's go be inaccurate with somebody else. Uh, did you watch this week's show? No. This week's, week's Cosmos? Enlighten or us. last week's Cosmos? Me either. This week's was about evolution, and, and they worked hard to make people think that intelligent design was stupid. Without ever using, they never used the words intelligent design, but it was clear the episode was really, last week's episode was about undermining uh, non-scientific authority. Right. This week's episode was about undermining any alternate narratives other than total, complete Darwinism. And so they picked, because one of the classic arguments against uh, against Darwinian evolution is the eye and something as complex as the eye. How mm-hmm. could it possibly have evolved randomly because it's so elaborate and multi-parted? Right. Um, and so they spent like 10 minutes saying, here's how the eye could have evolved without ever saying... 
intelligent designers say the eye couldn't have evolved, but they okay. did a really long explanation on the eye. And again, it's just, can we just talk about science without having the agenda? The preaching. Everything has an agenda. Much, much agenda. Okay. The other big news for the week, uh, Fred Phelps died. Yes, he did. We, t- we talked about Shortly that. Shortly after we yeah, talked about Yeah, we talked about, about that. it last week, but he wasn't dead yet. Well, now he's dead. He said, well, dead yet. And, and so was there I'm anybody dead. picketing his funeral? I'm dead. He's not going to have a funeral. Isn't that <laughs> ironic? Smart man. See, one guy <laughs> has ruined funerals for everybody, and now none of us can have funerals. <laughs> not going to have a funeral. We made a couple mistakes last week. Uh, Westboro Baptist Church is not in Oklahoma. It's in Topeka, Kansas. Thank you, listeners, for Thank keeping you. us honest. Thank you, Carmen Turner West. Uh, Jonathan Hirschman said also, for the record, Westboro Baptist Church stated in 2011 that they have about 40 members. We Not said like very big. less than 100, technically 40, and they're almost all related to each other. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's kind of like a hillbilly thing. Are you, are you insinuating inbreeding? Hey. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying No, anything. it's just all the family goes to one church. Uh, the, the Christian Science Monitor summed up his life. Said, Fred Phelps, a former street preacher who led a family ministry that raged against what he perceived as a morally bankrupt society, died Thursday. His legacy of picketing funerals of military veterans and disaster victims, promoting coarse language to condemn conduct he viewed as amoral and waging legal battles that protected his actions under the First Amendment, earned him an international reputation of a, uh, of a man whose absolute conviction was never swayed in the face of widespread contempt. That is his legacy, conviction in the face of widespread contempt. That's really trying to say something nice about somebody. Almost. You know, uh, I saw a headline, I think it was on the Daily Beast, about how Phelps was the, um, he was, uh, how did they put it, something like the best thing that ever happened to the gay movement. I, I heard that argument. That would make made sense because yeah. he galvanized, he, he, he generated he, compassion. He put a face on the opposition that was so extreme and ridiculous that nobody right. wanted to be associated with it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama, which tracks hate groups across the U.S., dubbed Westboro Baptist Church arguably the most obnoxious and rabid hate group in America. There you wow, go. So that's, a, that's an accomplishment. I think it's pretty. It's kind of a testimony. Do you know what it's a testimony to? What? It's a testimony to the ability of a small group of people to accomplish a tremendous amount. It's just, it's like... That is a good point. Well, I, it's like it, 20, it's a handful of people. Yeah, but it reminds me like... Look what they did. The, the media is they a big... They changed the world. The media is a big part of this story. Yeah. Because I think back to when Billy Graham had his crusade in Los Angeles. What year was that? 1949 or something like that. Yeah. And Luce, the guy who was in charge of Time magazine, he said, Puff, Puff Graham. Yeah. Right? He, he wanted we to... Like, we he, like this guy. We like this guy. Let's give him lots of media of attention. And that created sort of the Billy Graham phenomenon. And he got a lot of media coverage and a lot of influence. Similarly, with Westboro Baptist, in a negative sense, they serve... They were useful idiots, basically, for the media and for the gay agenda. Well, to they say, still are. They still are. But the media mm-hmm. gave them an, an, an exorbitant amount of attention and focus because... It painted the opposition to gay rights with such an extreme vision that no one wanted to be associated with it. So I think the media really created and gave them the platform that normally 40 people would never get, even when they're as extreme as that. Well, and it is sort of the, um, it is the extreme position. And I think they would assume that a lot of evangelical Christians, you know, would or in sort of that camp, mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. not as radical, but they needed, I think, this image, you know, to say this of is... Evil. Of, of, the face of evil. Yeah, they needed a face of evil. That it's kind of like the guy in Texas who said he was going to burn the Quran. I think that was Florida. Flor- yeah, that's what yeah. I meant. Florida, who was going to burn the Quran. And it's just one guy who right. just says a right. statement, right. and suddenly the whole world goes... Mm-hmm. And and looks at him, but you can only do that if you say outrageous mm-hmm. things. It's outrage. You but, have to be. You know the thing that I don't. How get, can normal people get attention? Healthy people, they well, can't. That's like sitcoms. They, they never attention. show healthy normal family dynamics. They're always right. dysfunctional. If the Simpsons were a healthy example of an American family, do you think that they would be running for what twenty five years or whatever it is now on TV? No. I'm I'm guessing that somewhere in this country there has to be an extremely outrageous. Um, 
stereotype gay advocate leader who who the most of the country would look at and go, oh my gosh, that person is completely off the wall, yeah. bizarre crazy. And if the media highlighted that person as representative of the entire gay community. Yeah, we'd all turn away against uh, the same-sex marriage. Probably. So I think that's what they did on the extreme Are you radical an cons- agenda? conservative. Are you yes. saying there's an agenda? So rather than bringing thoughtful people around this issue with you know, meaningful engagement oh and goodness. rational ideas, they, they represent it with extreme craziness. The Westboro Baptist Church issued a statement on Thursday uh, they, denying there was infighting among members, mocking media organizations for speculating in what it described as an unprecedented, hypocritical, vitriolic explosion of words. And then closed wow. by saying, listen carefully, there are no power struggles in the Westboro Baptist Church, and there is no human intercessor. We serve no man and no hierarchy, only the Lord Jesus Christ. No red shoes, no goofy hat, and no white smoke for us. Thank you very much. Wow. So mm. why not just slap the Catholic Church on your way out the door? Wow. Just, oh, sorry. As oh. you slap, slap the my mic. mic. I slap my mic. Yeah. That's um, harsh, harsh to the bitter end. In memory of our now it's not dearly only the gays, departed it's the father, will be harsh to the bitter end. Anyway, I, there isn't much more to say. Well, there's no, to see there's no infighting in the forward. Westboro Baptist Church because when they kicked everybody that, out. Yeah, they kicked a lot of people <laughs> That disagree with them. Well, they're too busy fighting everybody outside the church. Why would they fight one another? If you say there's no infighting, isn't that usually an indicator that there's some infighting? I guess it could if be. If you deny things... That's like it Iran it's saying that they don't have any gay people in Iran. Remember that? Yeah. When Ahmed Yeah, came yeah. to New York and, and, and staked And Sochi, that. Russia, the mayor, mayor of Sochi said right. that too. Oh, yeah. said, well, that, there is no gay people here. That's my sister, not my brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Well, well his, his brother was a little questionable. Oh, so just, I didn't know that. No, I made that up. Oh. <laughs> Well, now you're going to get like a libel suit. Oh, shoot. now we're in trouble. We've got a guest. It's the mayor of Sochi, Russia, <laughs> to ask me where I get my information. No, uh, we have a guest. We uh, found our new favorite podcast, which is actually a radio show in the UK. It's Justin Brierley's The Unbelievable Radio Program from Premier Christian Radio UK. And we've all been listening to it. So I uh, got a hold of Justin and asked him if he'd be on the show. Of course, he's not here. He's in London. But through the magic of television, if you're watching on the video, you will see him live on our set. Okay, here's, sort of. here's our interview <laughs> with Justin. Hello, welcome on. This is Justin Briley. Welcome back to the show. We are on the un- unbelievable podcast where we are putting believers and unbelievers together and letting them duke it out, fight to the death. It might get a bit sparky today. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. We've got a, an atheist and a devout Christian, and we're going to put them in a cage and <laughs> let them argue this topic. Which one of us is completely wrong about everything? <laughs> I'm sure it will be a sparky one. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am here with... Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was, I'm here with Justin Brierley. If you don't know who Justin Brierley is, you should, um, because he is the equivalent of both me and Sky on the other side of the pond, and maybe a little Christian Taylor thrown in for good measure. Uh, hi, Justin. Hello, Phil. It's it's such a pleasure to be on your podcast. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, so a friend of mine um, pointed me in the direction of your show. Uh, he's kind of a, a thinking Christian here in the U.S. who just loves podcasts. Um, he's a, 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 He went to University of Chicago Law School, so he's kind of a brainy guy who really became a devout Christian just in the last four or five years and has been you know, eating up podcasts left and right and said, have you, mm. have you heard the unbelievable show from the UK? You really need to. And I just started, I went online and just started looking at the guests you've had and kind of my jaw dropped open. You know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> holy cow, here's, you know, here's Richard Dawkins debating a, a, a Jewish rabbi and a, and a evangelical Old Testament yeah, scholar. Yeah. That sounds like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> it does. It does. And I actually wrote, I wrote up their conversation for a, a magazine I also write for called Christianity. And, and I did actually start with 
this may sound like a joke, but <laughs> did, have you heard the one about the atheist, the rabbi, and the evangelical who walked into a radio studio? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's great. I'm so glad you discovered it, though. And that's the beauty, obviously, of podcasting is suddenly know. you get people from all over the world yes. who suddenly discover you, a treasure trove of programs. You can You can grow your lack of revenue to be global. <laughs> Indeed, and still not, it... <laughs> still not make any money at it. Yeah, we can make stuff free for everyone around the world <laughs> instead of just here in the UK, right. which, is, which is marvelous. Yeah, it's absolutely. fantastic. So, okay, uh, Justin Brierley studied politics. I went online and saw your little bio. Uh, I see. I see. Studied politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford University. That's not impressive. Um, where he also met his wife, Lucy. They live with their soon-to-be two children or two children yet? Um, actually, uh, that's a really old bio because we've now got three children. Holy so. mackerel, would you update your bio, dude? <laughs> <laughs> this is the one on the radio station website. No, it's because, it's because um, I've actually, believe it or not, been asked this week to update my bio because it's so out of date. <laughs> so um, just okay. hasn't quite happened yet, but it will. And we'll add the fact that we have had two in fact are now on three so wow. um, okay yeah. <laughs> and, and, are, and are we are we sitting down there or do we press on more children well that is a good question <laughs> and one i'm not prepared to answer on your podcast okay so. that's fine because <laughs> you know i'm having your wife on the podcast next week and <laughs> you probably will at this rate, yeah actually. we will ask her <laughs> what she says uh your wife is a minister in the united reformed church and That's correct. And according to this, at least as of 12 years ago when this bio was written, uh, you split your time between looking after the kids, doing stuff for the church, and radio presenting. Yeah, and, and in a way, um, that continues today, though I have added this other aspect of, of what I do, which is writing for a, a magazine here in the UK that's kind of the equivalent of Christianity Today yeah, in the it's, US. It's Christianity is- Not Today. It, exactly. <laughs> it's just called Christianity. We, we dropped the today. So, um, uh, <laughs> because it's, it's yesterday, it's today, it's tomorrow, it's forever, right? Uh, it's eternal. And, um, and I, I write for them. Uh, that's a great joy. Uh, a lot of what I do on the show, obviously, there's, has, can sometimes have a life in the magazine as well in one way or another. So um, it, we're all owned by – we're all part of the same media group. So okay. that's, that's, that's which what is, – Which is yeah. what – is it like the radio that started or what, what came yeah, first? so it started off with the radio. That was established about – oh, getting on for 20 years ago now. And uh, Premier Christian Radio, but Premier Media Group now – Co- comprises uh, a set of magazines which include Christianity, okay. uh, the websites, the TV studio, and all kinds of things. So, and is, yeah. it, is it commercial? Are there ads in the magazines, or is it all donor-supported? It's both. So um, the magazine is certainly all commercial-supported. Um, uh, the the radio station is commercial and uh, donor-supported. Okay. So it's, uh, but, but what's different, I guess, to the scene in the U.S. is that Whereas you have hundreds of Christian radio stations, Premier was really the only Christian radio station yeah. in the UK, at least at the time it started. There are, There is one other um, smaller one elsewhere in the UK that shall not be named. No. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it, either way... After, it, since, it, since the Great Schism, is that when the uh, <laughs> second station was started? No, no, we're very friendly with them. Um, they're called UCB, I should say. Oh, okay. um, but uh, okay. the, 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 the point is, it, it's still kind of a tiny fraction, as it were, of, of what you get in the U.S. in terms of Christian radio stations. Right, and yet, and yet you're actually talking about real meaningful things, where we have a zillion radio stations <laughs> all playing... I danced with Cinderella. <laughs> well, look, I, the thing is, you probably get a very one-sided view if, if you only listen to my podcast, Phil. And, and in a sense, yes, the, the, the unbelievable show is certainly kind of, if you like, at the more intellectual, cerebral end of what we do on the radio station. Yeah. But we play, we have our music shows, we okay. have our chat shows, we have our, you know. But we, we're very much, we're probably 50-50 in terms of speech and, and music overall. Okay. Um, so we've, we've got, you know, shows where it's mainly music-driven and shows where there's a lot of guests and interaction and stuff. But I'd say the big difference, actually, is that we kind of had to apply for our radio license under the very specific condition that we would be abroad in terms of our reach, in terms of Christianity. And so we've always sort of had quite a breadth of Christian opinion on the show, uh, on, on, you know, the radio station. So we're not tied to any particular denomination or particular outlook. So you have to be by charter big tent Christianity. (laughs) 
It, to a degree, yes. I mean, inevitably, uh, uh, we tend to, you know, it, by and large, reflect a sort of evangelical outlook. And um, but you will find, you know, um, Catholics on certain radio programs, which might be an anathema to right. other Christian radio stations, you know, who who might right. who never sort of have that kind of content. So we we all get along very well, though, and uh, we've got presenters from all kinds of different denominational backgrounds. Do you think the, the fact that, like in the, in the U.S., uh, conservative Christianity has been such a dominant strain that we don't, uh, you know, in the U.K., you're feeling a bit more like a minority than we are. We're just starting to taste the feeling <laughs> of being a minority, and we really don't like it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because obviously, you know, we would hark back to the end of the 19th century for the, you know, the great times for Christianity in the UK, whereas you, you guys might just look back to the 50s or something. Right, um, right. And, and I think that it's certainly true that there has been a lot more of a sense of a minority for a longer time. And that does force inevitably um, in, in a more secularized country, you have to depend on each other a bit more. You haven't got the uh, the luxury of, um, of disagreeing with right. each other over the minutiae. You, you do have to do a bit more together, I think. And, and so in a way that, that can work towards the unity of the church. That is a bit of a blessing. Okay. Uh, did you grow up in church? Yes, I did. Uh, my parents were both Christian, still are, and um, they were both converted at university, though. Um, oh. To, to, as, uh, and, and I actually grew up, um, not many people know this, Phil, so this is a bit of an exclusive. Um, I, <laughs> I actually grew up within a, uh, a Christian organization called the Jesus Army here in the United what? Kingdom. And were they armed? <laughs> no, no, they weren't. We have some but, militias in Michigan that concern us. <laughs> but they they were in their day some seen as somewhat controversial within the uh, Chris, Christian sort of traditions, in as much as they were kind of a bit more of a closed community, if okay. you like. Um, Are you familiar with with like Jesus People USA and? That's exactly the kind of thing they were birthed in in okay. the sort of sixties and seventies. And my parents very much were converted into a kind of. My dad, you know, was a hippie, and uh -huh. uh, he, so you're the he son kind of, of hippie Jesus people. I am. I am. Yeah, I got the photos of him in his you know Afghan coat and everything to prove <laughs> it. But it's um. It, but they were they were actually you know they were both at Oxford when they were converted, and they they themselves, huh. if you like. Um, it, it was an interesting thing. It was taking the a lot of the, the, the early growth was among the intelligentsia, but who were devoting themselves to this very radical Christianity and living in community and yeah. and kind of going back to you know the New Testament early church principles of sharing everything in common and so on. Um, mm -hmm. so, and so you don't really know who your parents are because <laughs> you were shared among everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, possibly, but in reality, <laughs> I look the most like those two, so I'm going with them. <laughs> but that actually was probably I was probably about five or six when they left, so okay. it's really my older sister who has more memories of that time. But um, uh, just to cut the story short, really, um, they they moved on from that because in the end they felt that it wasn't actually a great place to for kids to turn into teenagers because okay. of the kind of strictures of the community and so yeah. on that it was in. It's a different place now, and and I, I don't want to judge you know where they are now in terms of the way they conduct themselves and so on. But that they moved from there into a sort of evangelical, charismatic kind of church. Uh, and that's okay. what I grew up in, really, and, and, and found my faith in. Okay, so you're not a, a Church of England kid. No, but interestingly, my parents both are now. Uh, so oh. they've kind of, you know, they've they've gone on a, an interesting journey of their own, where, and they're both now very involved in their local small village Church of England church. Okay. And that's that's where they feel they're being used best. So, so they've gone from the, They've come the, full circle back to the mother church. <laughs> They have. It's funny that that can. Ha I've seen that happen with lots of other people, though, as uh -huh, well. Uh -huh. Some of the people who kind of were the kind of agitators and you know the Jesus people of the UK, yeah. um, who actually in their sixties have gone to the the Church of England eventually. Wow, what do, you, <laughs> what do you know? So when you went to Oxford, did you go to Oxford because your parents went to Oxford? Was it expected or? Uh, it wasn't expected, but um, it was something that. Uh, I think my dad particularly encouraged me to to go for, and and I did, and um, and they said yes, so so that was nice, and uh, I didn't do what he did though. He did biochemistry, and I was never a 
a scientist really okay. um, so so i went for politics philosophy and economics mm-hmm. and, uh, and is yeah that, and had... is that like one major at oxford because it sounds like three <laughs> <laughs> well you kind of start off studying all three in your first year then you can drop one and i did drop the, the one i was worst at which was economics okay. um, um <laughs> but but you can't it's it's kind of like you you do it yeah it, i i don't i I don't fully understand the way you do it in the US with majoring in this and that, but effectively you gain a degree in PPE, even if you didn't actually do much economics, the EBIT. So, uh, so it's interesting, but uh, yeah, it was, it was three though, really interesting, wonderful years that Uh almost, you know, within three years, you can have so much experience uh, and, and a place like Oxford is a unique place to have that. Yeah. Yeah. And how did that affect your faith? I'd say my my faith grew at university. Um, I sort of would say I had a conversion experience uh, at about the age of uh, 14, 15, um, where God became very real in my life. I started to read, especially in my gap year before university, quite a bit of stuff like C.S. Lewis and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did kind of have a little kind of period where I just at university thought, gosh, I was being asked some hard questions by someone and I thought, what if none of this is true, right. basically? Right. And uh, and I went through a sort of dark night of the soul for about two or three weeks. And then I kind of came out of it again. And I just, I don't know, it, it wasn't that somehow all my intellectual questions got answered, but mm-hmm. just the feeling that maybe this is all not true went away <laughs> and, okay. but i kind of wanted what, to was continue. it an, an oh never mind that that <laughs> sounds wasn't. british it, oh it, never mind sorry but, <laughs> but it, it it was just a sense of that that i'd sort of i'd done my bit of i'd done my soul searching and, yeah. and i'd out the other side and felt like no i i've got a lot of reason for this yeah. um having said that that I, I, I at that point hadn't even really heard of the term apologetics, you know, okay. um, having said that, the the, the the Christian University Oxford was very strong and you, there was a lot of that available. But I didn't actually make avail myself of that much of it, though I was interested, as I say, in writers like C.S. Lewis. It was only once I started the broadcasting that I started to really open up. Um, the whole thing of the evidence for God and, and okay. that kind so of thing. So how did you and, go and, from how did you go from Oxford to apologetics on Christian radio? How how many years was that transition, and what what really were the the main sparks? Well, I'd say um, I, I got the bug for doing radio uh, in in um, some time in the the vacation when I did some work on a local radio station. And I thought I'd love to do this, and as it happened, um, I went away on a gap year with my wife. We married just after university, uh, and the, the the guy who ran the charity that we were working for in Africa said, "Oh, there's this Christian radio station in the UK called Premier." and uh, said, you, "You should apply to maybe do some work experience there." I, did that when I came back. And uh, after doing a few years, basically cutting my teeth in radio, to being a co-host on the breakfast show and that kind of thing, I wanted to have my own show. Mm-hmm. And I felt like we did a lot of talking about Christian stuff to Christians, right. but we didn't really talk to many non-Christians. And I thought that could be quite useful for the Christians listening mm-hmm. to hear. Mm-hmm. So I went to the station manager and I said, would you consider letting me have a show in which I bring on non-Christians and we do some kind of dialogue and maybe people could learn something in the, in the course of that? And uh, you know, to give him credit, he said, yeah, let's give it a try. Uh, and and so Unbelievable was born. It wasn't obviously a podcast to start with. Right, um, in, right. in fact, it was a completely live show when it started. So we took listener calls. Uh, it could go off in all kinds of different directions with the <laughs> listener calls. Um, but it was great fun at the same time. And at the same time, I learned very quickly a lot about what I came to, you know, term apologetics, right. um, have, having been very green behind the ears when I when I actually started. And that was like eight years ago? Well, yeah, the show began eight years ago, uh, just over. Um, so, and it's been podcasting for probably six years or something. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a heck of a lot of stuff in the archive now. So, uh, how do you how do you get? I mean, how did you start to get? Uh, first of all, non Christians to listen, and second of all, name non Christians to want to be on your show. <laughs> well, the first challenge really was getting 
the Christians listening to accept the concept of non-Christians being on. Ah. Because uh, to start out with, there was some some kickback from some of the listeners who said, I I don't want Christian radio station with atheists on, frankly. <laughs> uh, you know, we have enough of those on the BBC. Uh, <laughs> Why, why do we need them on our Christian radio station? Right. Um, and, and I just sort of, you know, would email back and say, well, look, it's only an hour on a Saturday. Uh, I'm sure we can cope, you know, in the whole of a week with hearing a, a non-Christian voice for, for an hour. Uh-huh. What, and, and was was management ever, I mean, how close did they come to saying, you're right, this is a terrible <laughs> idea? <laughs> They were aware, but I think they kind of, you know, again, to give them credit, they sort of trusted that it would be okay. Okay. Um, and they, I, I tried my best to to make it as balanced as possible. And um, and I think what happened in the end, quite honestly, is that people who didn't like it stopped listening at that time yeah. on a Saturday. Yeah. And people who did like it started listening. Mm-hmm. And um, and in the end, of course. Uh, it was really the podcast that 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 really started to grow. I mean, in a sense, your your radio audience is always somewhat static um, at, at a given time right, of the right. week. Whereas with podcasting, it's the niche market, and anyone who wants that and then can suddenly find right. it. And so, so you can find like, all the apologetics fans all over the exactly. world, <laughs> as opposed to all the apologetics fans in London on Saturday afternoon with a radio. Exactly. Yeah, which widens the net quite a lot. Yeah, and, it does. Um, so how did you get, I mean, how, you know, okay, so Lawrence Krauss is on the show. You know, we've talked, we, we reviewed his book, uh, The Universe from Nothing, because he was on mm-hmm. Stephen Colbert. Uh, and we saw him on Stephen Colbert first. It never even occurred to me, hey, I'm going to go track that guy down and see if he wants to be on my christian <laughs> podcast that seems kind of loony <laughs> how does that well, happen and uh, what's the pitch that makes him say okay i'll be on a christian radio show in the uk <laughs> on saturday afternoon <laughs> yeah it, it, it's surprising to me sometimes when people say yes i must admit but um the, the fact is um these guys have publishers they want to sell books yeah and um if you've got an audience and the fact is that the the point is with the podcast growth it's christians and non-christians and atheists um who are listening and so i can say well look we've got a variety of people listening to this show now um and uh and most of the time i've been pleasantly surprised to find that people are often who you might think you know think i don't see what what difference that would make to me have said yes um Hmm. not everyone has and and uh, it did take a while before I got Richard Dawkins on. Um, but <laughs> How many times did you try? How many other? Well, I tried a number of times, and um, and in a sense, uh, well, th- there were various things over the years where I, I would try to get him on for this or that, and he'd say, yeah. "No, thank you. No, not really my thing. Sorry, <laughs> just, not and, really um, my thing. I hate you all." <laughs> but this one just happened to tickle his fancy. Yeah, yeah, tickle his fancy. Because I, I listened to that one, and and he ultimately. He almost sounded slightly disinterested, like, you know, I'm I'm trying because really what I came away with it was that he he writes what he writes because he's mad about young earth creationists in the South in America. That, yeah, that's primarily I mean, why he does what he does. And when he's on a radio show with a progressive rabbi, you know, and an evangelical Bible scholar, and neither of them are taking those extreme positions, he's like, you know, oh, rats, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> These are reasonable people. I, I, my argument sounded a little silly. Yeah, well, I, I think that the interesting thing, though, is that um, he's also... I, you see, I have invited him in the past, for instance, to do discussions with people from the intelligent design community. Yeah. He's very, been very firm in term in turning those down. He doesn't, saying, that's not his I, fight? Well, saying, I don't want to give them the oxygen of publicity. Oh. And, mm-hmm. and because he holds that type of view of science in such disregard, he, he doesn't think... He'd be doing, you know, it would only be giving them, you know, this right. oxygen and so on. Right. So, right. but in a, in a way, um, yeah, I can see why, you know, he obviously takes that position. Which is which is sh- why he was against the uh, the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate. Indeed, indeed. Because he doesn't um, want them. Don't even don't even talk about it. It 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 legitimizes it. <laughs> 
exactly. Whereas I think when it comes to theology, he's almost like a little bit more, well, you know, yeah, I'll have a stab at that. But um, <laughs> it's kind of... I'll take a in swing. A sense, the, the, the obvious thing for him to get him on, if I could, would be to, to do that kind of a debate with someone in his area of expertise. Yeah. Uh, but it's the kind of... Because of, you know, his views on, on it, um, he, he simply has said no. Um, and, you know, fair enough, he... he I, he doesn't have to come on my radio show, um, but um, but he did on that occasion, and I was very glad for it, and mm-hmm. I did appreciate. Him. And I think actually, what you saw on there was uh, a lot less of the maybe typical image you might come away with of yes. Richard Dawkins, and you realised oh, he actually sounded quite reasonable in very many ways, yeah, and, and yeah. not sort of you know going in for the kill too much. Um, though well, obviously he he was forthright in what he did say. The most the, I, I thought the most interesting part of that interview was. You know, when I, I don't know if you you read the quote, but his long diatribe against the God of the Old Testament and, mm. you know, and both scholars pointing out that it was that's a really one sided, inaccurate portrayal. And Richard more or less saying, I just do that to get a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I open my talks like that, and everyone finds it funny. Yeah, so he didn't really even defend it. It was just like no, he said it's tongue in cheek. It's part it? of my shtick. <laughs> it's like oh, but, and, and it was interesting to hear him say that that he he really wrote that stuff, and and quite a lot I imagine of the God delusion is, is aimed at a sort of fundamentalist view of yeah. Christianity that that he obviously dislikes, and um, right. Uh, which which this... leads me to wonder, okay, I've, I've really started to see, you know, Richard Dawkins and and the Creation Museum as having a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> you know, like if one went away, the other would go away. But they have, they yeah, need I... each other. They require each other to balance out the energy of fundraising. <laughs> I think I think there may be a lot of truth in that, in a way. Um, and, and and well, I I I. I I would love Richard to come on and have a different kind of conversation again with, yeah. you know, my dream is let's get him on with the new Archbishop of Canterbury, someone like that, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and that can happen. It's amazing what you can pull together sometimes with okay. these kinds of shows. Do you, you know, do your you, own booking or do you have a, like, do you have a huge staff? <laughs> yes, I have a huge staff of one, which is me. Um, you do your own booking? Do all my own booking, all my own producing. Holy cow. Uh, I, I dispatch the thing to the podcast, which is why sometimes it goes wrong, but and everything else. But um, yeah, that that's the idea. I mean, I do, of course, have some backup in terms of um, we're, there's there's a radio team who who I can kind of bounce off for ideas and that okay. kind of thing, and um, some of the guests who come through. So some of those big names, especially in the Christian world, like uh, Rob Bell, who's been on the show and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, that's been because Rob's doing a tour in the UK. Yeah. He comes by just about the only Christian radio station in the UK, obviously, to, <laughs> the, to promote the it. The choice he of does, one. He, he does. He does the breakfast show. He does a pre-record for the afternoon show, and he goes on that guy who's interested in theology show as well. <laughs> um, and and when he gets on, he realizes um, that someone's asking him quite hard questions. And it's it's just it's just in a really interesting thing though that yeah, it is in a sense. You ask why why do I get these big names on the show, and it's well. Um, it's that's the beauty of being at really, you know, one of the only Christian yeah, right, radio stations right. in the UK in London. You get a lot of passing trade, yeah. and uh, sometimes they'll come in my studio and do a bit of a debate. So, hence, you know, it was great having Tom Wright on twice last year. Yeah, um, and uh, he's a big name, obviously, but um, he was um, coming in. He was going to be in London doing something. He's spoken on Premier a number of times before, and and at last I managed to get him to sit down for an hour and actually do um, a show with me, and then and then he came back and did a second one. Yeah, so, I, I assume his reaction once he did the show was, "Hey, actually, this is this has got some value. This is somewhat unique. You know, I'm going to keep this on my radar." Yeah, exactly. And I think I think that is you often break down mm. a preconception, and that that applies to a lot of the the non Christian guests I've had on over the years as well, who have maybe had a when you say Christian radio, right. that might pop up all kinds of flags for them. And then they come on and they, they realize, oh, it was actually OK. Um, so that was kind of Lawrence Krauss's reflection after he came on. He said, this this was a lot better than I was expecting <laughs> it to be kind of thing. Now, I, I don't think he was quite as um, 
uh, if you like, content to say that after the second outing, I don't know if you heard the second one I did with him. Which when, uh, was with whom? With John Lennox um, on, oh, okay. on God in the Cosmos, uh, in which he, he was a little bit more grouchy about that one. Cause, <laughs> but um, in any case, it, it, it's fun and, it, it, you know, you meet all kinds it's of fun. interesting Do you really people. think this is fun? Because some of those, like, that's... <laughs> It just seems terrifying. <laughs> I'm trying to, like, what's your personality type where you enjoy, oh, that was sparky. What fun, you know? And, like, the audience is sweating, you know? It's like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm, I, I, I am the kind, I'm, I'm, it's ironic because I'm actually, say I'm the person who least kind of goes for confrontation myself. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a very much a, resolver uh, but maybe that's a good thing to, to be hosting two different points of view yeah and well how control... often how often on the show do you get physically uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> not that often okay um, i mean if probably the worst one i ever had to try to compare um try try to host was a debate um between a muslim guest and uh, the Christian guest who was actually on the phone from the States, and I was very glad he was, in fact, in the end, because <laughs> they really started slagging each other off. And <laughs> you could a lot of people wrote in afterwards saying, I, I couldn't listen to that one. Yeah. It just got so, the vilification levels were so yeah. high. Yeah. And, um, and I, it was very difficult to kind of control either guest in this case. Um, <laughs> but you've because... never actually, like, stopped a show. <laughs> Just... I've never actually stopped a show. No, I've just said sometimes, look, we're not going to get any sense out of both of you if you talk over each other. We're not, you know, I I must ask that you don't, you know, go down that road or something like that. Right. It's rare. Right. It's rare. Yes. Um, obviously, s drama is a good thing as well uh, when it's, you know, in the right proportions. Uh -huh. no, no one wants to listen to a, a dreadfully kind of calm and measured right. thing the whole time. I suppose. And so it's nice to have some shows where you do get a little bit of a, you know, confrontation going on. Yes, the recent ones with, I, I forget their names, is, the, is he Irish? <laughs> um, well, are you thinking of the two with David Robertson yes. and Matt Dillon? Mm, yeah, so that's a good example because yes, I got the, I got a little uncomfortable in in and the, you got uncomfortable with the Christian speaker. I did. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and it, well, there was I, a little too much. The one specific line that really got me was turning to the atheist and saying, "My, you're giving me a lot of rope to hang you with." <laughs> And I thought, oh, I don't think Christians should be saying that <laughs> about non-Christians, uh, this it, side of the Inquisition. It's interesting because I've had so much response to both those shows. Yeah. And it's sort of been split right down the middle from Christians, this is, saying, I loved the way David Robertson gave as good as he got and, you know, mm. really, you know, yeah. held the atheist feet to the fire. Um, whereas others saying that was not a Christ-like way to be interacting and so on yeah. now. Uh, David, you know, can speak for himself on that. Um, I, I, I hate David very highly, actually, because he's he's a very good communicator. Um, maybe he goes sometimes a little too far in the heat of the moment when you're in that kind of debate setting. Yeah, but yeah. he is extraordinarily good at kind of coming back quickly though not everyone appreciates the style in which, which he does it yeah. with. Um, so. Is that a, is that a uh, more of a... I'm thinking about, you know, like the classic debates of old where, you know, at Cambridge or Oxford, you know, and with, with the Huxleys and the Wilberforces and all those guys. Is that simply kind of a British tradition of, you know, mano a mano, let's go at it with our big, big British brains <laughs> and see and see who's left. Because a lot of, you know, I grew up in the Midwest in the U.S. I actually mm. grew up in Iowa. We're very polite here. Yes. We're polite. <laughs> and so that can be a bit shocking. And I'm wondering if it is kind of a cultural distinction of British intellectual life, the, the fondness of intellectually grappling with an opponent. Yeah, I, I think there is a certain amount of that. Having said that, of course, the British are, are well known for their politeness in general and, and, and not wanting to offend people too much. And so um, yeah. in, in a way, the, the, the show in that sense sometimes goes contrary to okay. the, a natural tendency to sort of, you know, one doesn't talk about 
religion, politics. You talk about the weather sort right, of thing. Right. Um, but I think I think there is a hunger, having said that, uh, among certainly a lot of British Christians who, having been faced with quite a lot of flack from the you know secularist side of of the country, mm -hmm. uh, want to hear strong responses. Want to hear mm -hmm. you know people standing up and not kind of being too. Right. airy fairy and oh look another cup of tea and i'm sure it'll be fine you know <laughs> they want to hear something a bit more dogmatic in, in in a sense you know probably some of the them are, are saying we need to be a bit more like some of our american brothers and sisters who who tell it like it is and you know to have a bit more of the jerry springer kind of <laughs> yeah mentality. but we're, it's always a balance isn't it you we're can't not go too we're far. not fond of that in the midwest <laughs> although jerry springer did his show in the midwest and but <laughs> but that doesn't count that's yeah no. i'm just I, in my own interactions you know because i i kind of waded in a bit on some of these books and ended up you know interacting with peter bogosian who i guess he just told me he's going to be on your show uh that's coming, right coming yeah up got, not too got him long. booked in for may i think yeah, and and what I've discovered is is that because the the world of of uh, interaction and conversation on the internet is so brutally unkind, mm. um, you know that when I come into a conversation, really speaking the truth, but in a completely loving way, and particularly actually admitting when they make a good point, you know. That's a really good point you've made. I may be wrong yeah. about that. I may yeah. have to rethink that. That it actually just it just blew people away. It's like, wait, yeah. what did you just say? <laughs> you agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I'm not 100 percent wrong about everything yeah. in your yeah. worldview. Yeah. And I just I, I want to see that kind of you know that grace graciousness mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. interaction that we should just we should be the first ones to say you know what I might be wrong you know what you raise a good point you know what there is some truth in the position you're taking and I just I don't hear that enough. Yeah, and and I think you're absolutely right on that front, Phil, because the problem with the internet and the way that the debating goes on there between atheists and Christians is Holy it cow. immediately breaks down into yeah. eff effectively uh, name calling and 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 so on right. so quickly. Uh, what has been really interesting is sometimes when you actually get some of those people who might be well known online as being a real kind of, you know, hardline atheist debater or, or mm -hmm. Christian or whatever, you put them in a studio face to face with someone <laughs> instead of behind a keyboard. And it can be very, very different. Uh -huh. um, suddenly they're quite polite and respectful and they'll have the back and forth. And you realize um, a lot of it is a facade, what's going on online. It's about entrenching your position and, and doing all the, you know, batting for your side and so on. When you actually get into a proper conversation with someone face to face, you often have a completely different kind of interaction. And, and right. that's what's really interesting to see is that that what you can kind of model something quite different. I don't know if you'll ever see that actually translate, though, realistically into, you know, what happens on Facebook when people start debating right. each other. Right. To a certain extent, I think the comments should be disabled for the Internet, <laughs> not just for one person's <laughs> website. For the entire Internet, from now on, comments are disabled because nothing good happens there. It just, if you want proof, I, I, the comment sections on websites should be adequate proof of fallen humanity and possibly of Calvin's doctrine of total depravity, I think. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> you point point to the comments on any Yahoo story dealing with religion or philosophy or anything, and the argument should be over. Don't yeah, you, don't yeah you well, I, I know what you mean. It, I, I, I do think, though, that in general, um, a lot of people who start out kind of thinking, I've got to win the case on the Internet, quickly become disillusioned. You know, it's yeah. like there's that cartoon that goes around where some, some man's wife is saying, aren't you going to come to bed? And he says... Hold on a minute. I have to continue. Someone's wrong about something on the internet, you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> you're ever going to win that fight. Okay, but, one uh, more question because I I can't take any more of your time. You've got a life. Um, what when you started out? When you said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull off this show. I'm gonna I I just want to see if I can pull this off." What what fruit were you hoping to see from that? And in what ways have you have you seen it now eight years later? 
I was hoping um, that it would be the kind of show, this was kind of what I went on in my head, that people would gather their non-Christian friends to the radio set and say, <laughs> listen with me, and we will hear some excellent reasons for believing in God, um, and that there would be people kneeling and accepting Christ uh, as they listened. Um, that quickly evaporated uh, <laughs> as, as an idea, um, because ah, what I... Ah, youth. <laughs> what I discovered was... Oh, there were good arguments on both sides, yes, and, and yes. it creates an interesting discussion. And and people email in and say, "I didn't agree with that," and I did agree with that. And what I saw as the fruit of that was when atheists started and, and non Christians and skeptics started tuning in via podcasts and so on. Uh, I got a lot of emails from people saying, "I don't agree with you, but I'm really glad you're talking about it, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm impressed that a Christian radio station would put on this kind of program and so yeah. on." And uh, and what I started to see also was people saying, I wouldn't call myself a Christian, but when I started listening, I was this kind of an atheist, and now I'm slightly less of an atheist <laughs> than I was. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and, 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 and then, you know, over the years, obviously, some people have emailed in to say, Unbelievable was part of my journey to faith, and, mm-hmm. and that's been wonderful. There have been some of those stories. I think probably, though, more generally, for in terms of those who have maybe moved slightly along the spectrum somewhere it's been about simply having the conversations and especially for those who tune in week in and week out it's broken down some preconceptions about christianity because i don't think you can listen to um you know a few of them and Mm -hmm. still come away thinking christianity is just a load of fairy tales and superstition right even if you don't you're not convinced by the arguments you heard you'll have heard someone hopefully fairly cogent and intellectually respectable right. making the case and hearing a good response. And so for me, it's 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 often about simply changing the terms of the debate a little and saying, will you listen? And and then you obviously have to leave it, uh, you know, from my perspective, in God's hands as to what, what happens beyond right. that. Right. Absolutely. Well, cool. Justin Brierley, it was great to have you on the show. I'm not going to do a wrap-up song because I'm actually, we're going to have uh, uh, Christian and, and Sky come on tomorrow to finish up this episode and then do a wrap-up after they listen to your interview. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, but I appreciate your time. Um, and hopefully you can come on again sometime because I had more stuff I wanted to talk about that we I'd never even got come to. back on. And I was going to say, Phil, um, it probably uh, I could do an interview with you. We've got a show called The Profile here on our radio station. And, and I think Ooh. it would be fascinating to hear your story too. So oh. it, it's a two-way invitation. <laughs> That's fantastic. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the time, Justin. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Phil. Yep. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye. So that was the interview with Justin Brierley. What did you think? I thought it was fabulous. <laughs> I thought it was fabulous, too, and I He's loved hearing brilliant. him talk. He's our first real Brit. We had Oz Guinness. He's a real Brit. Yes. Yeah, but he's been over here forever. So, and he even says his own accent is not very British. It's been, like, Americanized? Diluted. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah it's, it's odd. So... So I think Justin counts as our first real, genuine Brit. I guess he does. Huh. I thought it was great. I, I love what he does on that podcast. I think. Yeah. Um, so we're big fans. We, we mentioned it before that we wish there was more content like that coming out of American Christian yeah. radio. Yeah, and he said that he's now getting a lot of listeners who say, I heard about you on the Phil Vischer podcast, and he's mentioning the Phil Vischer podcast on his radio it's show. The Phil Vischer bump. It's a big Happy family. It's, see, we can get along with the British after all. <laughs> we apologize for that misunderstanding. You know, you're such ter- a... Don't apologize. You're a terrible misunderstanding. Oh. You're a... Yeah. Uni- we don't apologize. You were wrong. <laughs> Monarchists. You're a uniter. But I bring people together. You're a uniter. He's a lover, not a fighter. I bring people together for, for That's happiness. That's your gift. Uh, the Phil Vischer Podcast is brought to you by Buck Denver Asks What's in the Bible. The, the final issue is now out. Volume 13, God's Kingdom Comes, which wraps up the whole 13-part series and walks you all the way through the Bible. It is also brought to you by Sky Jatani's new book, Futureville, by Sky Jatani. Right there it says Sky Jatani. Um, discover your purpose for today by reimagining tomorrow. Available wherever finer books are sold, or at mostly just Amazon. Did you hear what my twelve-year-old <laughs> like said about Sky's new book? World. What did your twelve-year-old say about Sky's Sky new book? Sky told, uh, or Josh told Sky's wife Amanda that his book was amazing, and Amanda said, "You read his book?" He goes. 
people know, but the cover is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an awesome cover. There you go. Come for the cover. All you need to know. Stay for the words. <laughs> That's how I sell my books. Yeah. Okay. Sing let's us a song. Sum this up. Oh, J- Justin, not Jason. <laughs> oh, Justin Brierly has a radio show. He talks to atheists. You never know how it's going to go, but he does a pretty good job at getting them not to fight. And with God's help, it always turns out mostly right. And it's a good conversation, even if nobody ends up down on their knees in front of their radio, asking Jesus into their British little hearts. Thanks, Justin, for being on the show, and we'll keep running your show. See you next time. Bye, everybody. See ya.